Hey, I want to give special thanks today on the video here. Uh, the fact that you can see me at all is thanks to Theater Monkey, who helps me shoot my Tech Republic 5 apps videos. And uh, my bulbs burn out yesterday afternoon. So I called him up and was like, hey, do you know where to get bulbs? And he, uh, he volunteered to go, not only go get the bulbs this morning, but then like ninja style, drove his scooter across Los Angeles with them crossed like katanas on his back uh, <laughs> and arrived. And, and now we have light again. So the fact that thanks, you can see Theater me Monkey. is entirely thanks to Theater Monkey. Uh, it was actually pretty impressive to see him ride up with the, the light bulbs. <laughs> All right. So you guys ready? Yep. All right. Darren, you ready? Yeah. yeah. All right. Here we go. Oh, I didn't do my voice uh, for... Um... <laughs> That's your voice for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the one voice. It's the Spaghetti Tonight voice. <laughs> it's the Spaghetti Tonight guy. Hi, everybody. I'm having spaghetti tonight. <laughs> Let's watch. Da, 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 da. Oh, we're already off to a good show. All right, here we go. <laughs> Count Ready? us in. <laughs> Hold your breath. The Daily Tech News Show is entirely supported and funded by voluntary contributions from listeners like you. If you want to chip in and support your daily source of tech, visit patreon.com slash acedetect. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 26, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today is Darren Kitchen of Hack5.org. How's it going, Darren? Hey, hey it's so good to see you back, Tom. Uh, not much going on in security this week. Um, no. I'm sure we'll dig something up to talk about. You know, whatever's, whatever's laying around, let's come up with something catchy. <laughs> Got to come up with something good so Len Peralta can draw it. He is our art prov master, art illustrating prov. the show. Hi, everybody. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Is that Winston Churchill? It is. It is. That's my. I just. I just this is you. This is Tom Merritt. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Merritt. Wow, it's like I'm here on myself. Exactly. It's good to be here, and uh, hopefully I'll draw something great. We'll see. Yes, I'll I know go. you will. I have the faith. <laughs> and these are the headlines. Gigahome reports good news for BlackBerry, uh, but first the bad news. Handset sales were down 200000 to $2.4 million, and the company lost $207 million. However, that's quite a bit less than the $965 million that they lost a year ago. Not to mention, BlackBerry has $3.1 billion in the bank cash, plus the BlackBerry Passport received 200,000 pre-orders, which ain't bad. See, they're totally not palm. Not at all. Not. No. Don't even joke. Poor no. man. Sysadmins the world over continue to deal with the shell shock vulnerability with patches out for most Linux distros, but not all of them are complete patches. Consumers should be most concerned about devices with embedded systems like routers and webcams, as well as OS X. Apple says most OS X users will not have the Unix services turned on that would allow attackers to take advantage of the vulnerability. However, a patch is in the works for those sophisticated users that might have turned on those services. Bash maintainer Chet Ramey said on Twitter he had notified Apple of Shellshock several times before it was made public. Apple uses an older version of Bash, version 3.2.51 parentheses 1, uh, because the company avoids GPL v3 licensed software like Frankenstein's monster avoids villagers with torches, apparently. We're going to talk quite a bit more about uh, shell shock in a bit. Reuters reports the European Aviation Safety Agency said Friday it will allow passengers to use portable electronic devices throughout the entire flight without being in airplane mode. That's right. Your 3G, your LTE, you can just have it on if you're in Europe. ESA said this is the latest regulatory step toward enabling the ability to offer gate-to-gate -gate telecommunications or Wi-Fi services. Each airline will have to conduct a safety assessment before changing their policies. TechCrunch reports Apple released iOS 8.0.2. The new update includes all original fixes promised in the earlier update and fixes the cell reception issue with iPhones 6 and 6 Plus, as well as a bug in HealthKit app that delayed release of compatible apps and a bug where third-party keyboards would default back to Apple's keyboard when activated inside an app. Apple said in their apology about the 
mistaken iOS update earlier this week that fewer than 40,000 devices were affected by the bad release, which was pulled after an hour. Ouch, reverting back to Apple default keyboard. Is that, let's make that worst bug of 2014. <laughs> you know, actually, let's the anything new, better comes up in this show. The new Apple default keyboard is better uh, mm -hmm. because it actually gives you some of those swift key like. Uh, suggestions, those swipe-like suggestions. But uh, The tech press all decided to notice social network Ello today. It's been around for a while. Uh, it, I think it got a big boost at XOXO. That's my theory. Anyway, uh, maybe it's just because it's Friday. I don't know. And Gadget reports Ello is notching up 20,000 new users an hour, despite being invite only. Ello is created by designers and artists. Its CEO, Paul Budnitz, is founder of that toy company, Kid Robot. Its central premise is that it will not turn you into a product to sell to advertisers, so no ads. The idea is to provide basic functions for free, but more advanced functions, like if you wanted to have multiple accounts managed from one login, say, they might charge you a couple bucks for that. Budnitz says, we're not competing, we're just building this thing that we really want to use. ZDNet reports that Amazon has officially acquired game streaming service Twitch and its more than 55 million active monthly users for $970 million. Amazon VP of Games Mike Frazzini said the deal came together after Amazon met with Twitch leaders and decided their culture was an awesome fit with Amazon's culture. Because obviously, live streaming gaming and packaging up things in boxes perfect fit. To recap, Amazon now owns an incredibly popular live streaming platform for less than one Instagram. Recode reports that Intel will pay up to $1.5 billion for a 20% stake in two mobile chip makers with ties to the Chinese government. Intel will acquire the stake in Spreadtrum Communications and RDA Microelectronics through a deal with Tsinghua Unigroup in an attempt to catch up to rival Qualcomm in the mobile chip market. Time for some news from you. These come from our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Habitoila Condolci pointed out Samsung announced its highest capacity SSD yet. The SM1715 can store 3.2 terabytes of data and is in production right now. The drive is made using Samsung's 3D VNAN technology. That's the one where storage chips are placed on top of each other. The random read speed of the drive is 750,000 IOPS. That's input-output operations per second. And write speed is 130,000 IOPS. Price and chip dates were not announced, but hopefully it's going to be cheaper than the $20,000 LSI Nitro. That's 3.2 terabytes. Oh, man, I can't wait to see a Beowulf cluster of these. Bring yeah. It. Okay, can you imagine if you had the money to do a Beowulf cluster of $20,000 solid-state oh, drives? Who, who does? The NSA? Oh, they could use these, too. Oh, wait. That's what they built in Utah. Oh. SP Sheridan shares a BBC report that the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation is, quote, very concerned about Apple and Google's plan to create file encryption systems to which the companies would have no access. The head of the FBI, James Comey, told reporters that lives could depend on continuing access to device data. The FBI is holding conversations with both companies. Apple and Google have not yet responded. We have keys to all your houses. Oops, I wasn't supposed to say that. Comey is imagined to have said by me. <laughs> Dude, I love this. Didn't we say like a year ago after the initial Snowden leaks, like this will eventually trickle down and make uh, the world a better place for all consumers? You know, I mean, this is definitely an example of me personally being happy that I am now more sure that my data is going to stay on my device and it's in my hands. Of course, I could still screw that up if I want to. But, you know, it is it is like locks on houses. Encryption is breakable uh, and locks are breakable. But, you know, the, the police don't say, you know, we really would like people to not put locks on their houses because sometime we might need to go into a bad guy's house and that's going to make it more difficult for us. Well, no, no, it's just, you know, normally they can just, you know, break the door down, but it's a lot harder to do that with the encryption stuff. So it's like, come on, guys, you're making it like, you know, me, normal people don't have fortress houses. They just have regular front doors. <laughs> right. I'm imagining Comey went into the uh, to the IT department at the FBI is like, Will this battering ram open an iPhone encryption? No? Oh, crap. Mm, but maybe a rubber hose will get them to divulge their password. <laughs> well, and that's, that's really where the vulnerability lies, is forcing you legally to comply with handing over your password. That's what's going to happen. They're going to get so, the courts to, to say, you're in contempt if you don't give us your password. Yeah. Ancrod, too, pointed out the Moscow Times article noting Russia's Roskomnadzor agency, which supervises the media and communications, has notified Google, Facebook, and Twitter that they must register as organizers of information distribution 
and therefore keep information about Russian users on servers located inside the country. Companies have until the end of the year to register or risk administrative sanctions. See, in fact, this goes right back to the previous story in that what technology giveth, politics taketh away. Well, if you just think of your iPhone with its data stored inside there and not in the cloud uh, in certain cases, just imagine Russia as a really big phone, right? <laughs> Mm. It's it's just they're just saying we just want the data to be stored here where we can see it. And that is a look at the headlines. All right, I want to kick off our discussion story. We got two. We're not, we got, we got a drone story. We haven't had a drone story in a while. Uh, but first, we got to talk about shell shock because there's a few more things that have come out since we talked about it yesterday. James Songer wrote in and he said, in the coverage of shell shock, everyone's jumping to the conclusion that every Linux, Unix, BSD based embedded device is vulnerable since they all include Bash. That's just not the case. Embedded devices, even Android devices like phones and tablets, use a shell called BusyBox instead because it requires much less storage and memory then Bash uh, plus Core Utils provides all the basic unit commands like LS, Echo, DF, etc. Um, well, as a manufacturer of embedded devices, I can actually attest to the fact that, yes, BusyBox is a lot more lightweight, and we did use it on the Wi-Fi Pineapple for years as the default shell. In fact, I still believe slash bin slash sh points to busy uh, points to busybox well we still also include bash for some of the more advanced functions that said even though like i mean sure there's that uh, technically you could construe like all of the millions of embedded devices that are possibly vulnerable to this you know and my beloved pineapple here uh, included except for the fact that we don't take advantage of this quote unquote feature in any sort of way that exposes the vulnerability to uh, be exploited. So uh, did we patch it? Yeah, it's patched. It's in the next firmware. Is it exploitable right now? Well, not in most circumstances. Yeah. And, and I, you know, James sort of sets it up as like, everyone's saying this, and I don't think everyone's saying this, but it is the, you know, the fair counter argument is that, yeah, sure, Loads of newer stuff use BusyBox, and they've used BusyBox for years now. But really, I think the, the ones that you would be most concerned about are older devices, older routers particularly, I would think, where people have used them for years because they're just not that into technology, and they're least likely to update the firmware on those, and those might have Bash. Yeah, and the least likely to be updated as we go forward, as we enter into this quote-unquote world of Internet of Things, it's going to be Internet of Vulnerable Things, where yeah. there's not... A, uh, there's not a commercial pressure for manufacturers to put in place mechanisms to do things like convenient firmware updates and things of that nature, or even you know any sort of interest in uh, squashing some of these things when it like you know for instance in this case it may or may not uh, it, the the uh, attack surface is so low that uh, some may wonder how serious it is. Now I'm not disputing the fact that it's serious. Like, this is a big one. This is a really big, juicy, awesome, quote-unquote, bug in the sense of, like, Heartbleed, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and all that said, too, I think that the other thing to, to keep in mind in, in James' defense is that you don't want to assume just because you have an embedded device that you're vulnerable, right? It may have BusyBox, and you may be totally fine for now. Uh, but the point is, is, is to check, is to get everybody to be like, you know, don't just assume... You're fine. Take take what some you, responsibility into your own hands. Or what you can assume is if it's running Linux, it most likely has Bash. And if it has Bash, it's probably bad, so you should switch to Windows. It's more secure. <laughs> Wait, who you are you? From Hack5 Darren with a mustache. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Evil Hack5 Darren. Uh, but no, James is right. I think a lot of people may be overreacting, uh, like all oh, the Internet of Things. Uh, but I don't think everybody's overreacting. All of that said, uh, iMore did get the statement. For, I think they got it first. It was the first place I saw it anyway from Apple saying, quote, OS 10 systems are safe by default. Don't ever say things like that. I know what they mean. They they are not exposed to remote exploits of Bash unless users configure advanced Unix services. Uh, and they are working to provide a software update for advanced Unix services. Stack Exchange has instructions to recompile Bash using Xcode. If you are one of those users, like, actually, yes, I have used these advanced services and I need to figure this out. Uh, patches 25 and 26 are out. There's a discussion going on on sec lists, though, about whether using set UID or set GID is a vulnerability or not. 
not. So they've gotten down to that point where they're like, bug or feature, bug or feature, where's the responsibility lie? Which is a good good sign in my estimation. Uh, Google has taken some steps to fix bugs in its services. Amazon has published mitigating steps for any vulnerable customers on Amazon Web Services. Red Hat has a couple of patches out. As we've mentioned, one of them is incomplete. Uh, Debian Wheezy has a patch. CentOS, Ubuntu all have updates. Uh, some sporadic reports out there of botnets and DDoSs. Uh, it's hard to confirm whether they're really taking advantage of this or not, but some security firms seem to think they are. Darren, I, I feel like yesterday, you, you summed it up perfectly earlier. This is a very important and awesome, in, in other words, it is, it is full of awe when you look at this vulnerability because up to 50% of web servers could theoretically be vulnerable to it. And it's been around theoretically since 85. Although I think I saw Chet Ramey saying, yeah, we think the vulnerability probably came along in like 94, 92, somewhere in there. Yeah, but that's pretty historic in internet years. Even so, yeah, that's, that's a long time. We don't know if anybody's been taking advantage of it before now, but you could assume some state actors might have been. That, that's uh, the tinfoil hat angle, and I absolutely love it. And it makes you wonder, in a post-Snowden world, why we're actually seeing things come out, uh, especially things that are vulnerable in these kind of mainstay applications that are part of the open source stack that we uh, so know and love, like OpenSSL in the terms of Heartbleed, and like uh, Born Again Shell in terms of Shell Shock, worst name ever. <laughs> Shell Shock's worse than Heartbleed? Yay! Mm, it's we'll a let pun. them fight it out. We'll let them fight it out. I, and interestingly, this is one of those things where it's like, yes, it's making great headlines because, yeah, it's very important. But unlike Heartbleed, um, there's nothing really that you can tell a user to do. In fact, going back to what Apple said, uh, what they meant when they made that statement was, our our customers use iPhoto, not Bash. Like yeah. they don't know how to open the terminal, do they? Do we, yeah, do and, we and let there's them do that. And the and the the worrisome thing would be if I could go to a malformed website and it would execute Bash and own my computer. Uh, it sounds like what Apple is claiming is that wouldn't happen unless you've configured some other services mm -hmm. to be able to take advantage of Bash. We lock we lock that down in the standard distribution of OS X. Right, and uh, in, in the case of uh, you know for most consumers, when we were talking about Heartbleed, it's like well the the vuln exists on the service provider side, but as a good precaution you might want to change your password in this one it's like that's not necessarily like you know there, there isn't necessarily consumer advice for this one you know like most uh most people this doesn't affect and, yeah. and if it does you probably already know exactly i think that's a good way of putting and, it and like, in, a, in another sense though you can also if you know what you're doing you probably also know say for instance you're a php programmer you're probably also aware that the php system execute function could be used maliciously but it's there because it's convenient and if you do it right and you sanitize your input everything will be right. a-okay for the most part and it seems like patch 25 and 26 have really shut down the the really like nasty stuff that shouldn't have been there and now we're on to the that sort of like well if you use it responsibly how idiot proof should back become has become the conversation well you know the idiot proof if we harken back to the 90s when this began uh, this bug uh, we look at say some of the HTML that's quote unquote valid in most modern browsers but if you check w3c they're not even listed because you know people just started using uh, HTML tags that didn't necessarily exist and you know the uh, mosaics and Netscapes of the world had to adapt and say, oh, God, "Well, I fought the I fought against iframe for years and lost." Yeah, but uh, <laughs> only noobs use frames, duh. But uh, anyway, um, it's one of those things where you could—is this a feature? Is this a bug? I I say it's a it's a fug. It's a fug. It's a feature bug. Mm. Or mm. a big chur. No, a fug. No, it's I like the fug. fug. I like yeah. it. It's definitely and, a fun. And you know what? It doesn't affect me at all. I'm using TCL, JK, <laughs> LOL. <laughs> yeah, it's it, 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 let's let's bring this back for the folks who are like, I'm not a sysadmin, so I'm, you know, do I need to worry about this? Probably you don't. Uh, if you do have a router that's older, uh, especially, but really if you have any router, you might want to double check it, that it's up to date on its firmware. Uh, and if you have a, a router that's locked down by the ISP, you want to call the ISP and say, hey, what, you know, you guys going to update this? Uh, and if you have any Internet of Things devices, again, Steve Gibson gave great advice yesterday. Put them on the guest 
part of your your network so that they're not on the same part that you're accessing with the rest of your computers and make sure that their firmware is updated and then wait for the uh the os 10 update uh to come along but i i darren would you agree that you don't need to panic no, you don't need to panic, but you definitely need to read every line of source code that anything, a computing device in your world uses, as well as monitor every single packet that transgresses your network. Stop networks. it. You're scaring what? people. Oh, I'm just saying. If you want to really be secure. Yeah, no, but that, that's, that, that's actually where I was going, is you don't need to do that. You don't no. need to read every line of source code. You just kind of want to check and make sure your firmware is up to date. That's just good practice anyway. Right? Yep. Yeah, and it's good to see the vendors responding very appropriately as far as the Googles and the Amazons for the AWSs and whatnot. Yep. Uh, our second story, the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States is allowing six companies to fly drones under controlled circumstances while shooting video, movies and TV stuff. Uh, Astrius Aerial, Aerial Mob, Pictor Vision, Hella Video, Snaproll Media, and RC Pro Productions Consulting all got approval. Apparently a seventh filmmaker is requesting approval, and that's pending as well. They have to do a lot, Darren. Did you look into, like... All the oh, stuff that they had to file and agree to to get this permission? It's ridiculous. Do you have the list? Because it's kind of insane. Well, Hella Video, for example, has a 38-page exemption, which includes 35 provisions restricting the weight, speed, and flight elevation of the aircraft, requiring inspections and test flights after maintenance, requiring the operator to have a pilot's license and 25 hours of prior drone flying experience, requiring documented test runs before actual video recording, and a restriction that people not involved with the production must be at least 500 feet away. Three days before flying, the companies have to notify the FAA with detailed plans, and if the drone flies too high or too far laterally, the operator must report it. Okay, so this is not a victory in any sense for for Damn. consumers. For no, no, like like you know the, the headlines. Ooh, certain people get to use uh, drones for movie making. That's good, right? No, could you imagine if every farmer that wanted to check their crops or monitor their, their livestock had to go through that kind of like the FEA is three years behind even getting to what Congress told them that they needed to do like in 2011, and. Th then they come up with these kind of rules. They don't have the manpower to do this kind of stuff for the amount of people that are out there trying to do this. Like, look at this device. This thing is like 37 grams. Am I going to have to contact the FAA every time I want to fly this around my cat in my living room? And Please keep the cat 500 feet away from the drone, sir. I will not. I will not keep the cat away from the drone. <laughs> come and arrest me, FAA. Uh, yeah. And, and Honestly, if you fly it inside your house, I guess you're not going to get in trouble. But... But well, that's the thing. Like, I, I actually, in in some regards, I don't mind the things like, okay, well, we, you know, in these instances, we require, say, the uh, drone operator to have a pilot's license, right? They don't have special unmanned aerial vehicle licenses yet. So until then, uh, they they want to make sure that people are being responsible, and you know, they're certifying certain crafts in some instances. But it's just like at a certain point, had we just had some sane rules years ago, we wouldn't be behind the rest of the world in this regard with like these little oh we made six exemptions that's progress that's not progress this is actually a symptom of the problem is what you're yes. saying yeah. yes because this is not sustainable maybe actually making some uh rules you know or actually making something that we can actually put into the the comment uh the uh what, what is it called the uh the uh proposed regulations the the um uh, I'm losing my my, my proposed here. regulations so, works. I'm, I'm right where where we actually have a chance to like we're supposed to get 18 months to be able to actually review what the proposed regulations are before they get voted on and turned into rules. Not not what the FAA has been doing by like making special interpretations of rules. For instance, for model aircraft, which makes me flying this with goggles illegal. You know, by updating policies rather than just making some sane regulations that we can all look at and see and comment on, and then they can accept those comments and then. And it can go and get voted on and become a law where there's actually a avenue for people to say like, oh, hey, I'm a filmmaker. Let me get my quote unquote drone pilot's license and then, you know, operate in a legit manner with a craft that's been, you know, verified to be safe in, uh, in a manner that doesn't require like, like six, six drone operators, six, maybe Sorry. seven. Yeah. Oh, oh, maybe there might be seven. Wow. So September 2015. 
is the next deadline. What's what's your what's your guess that they that they actually have gonna, some proposed rules? They're not going to make any of these deadlines. They no. are two years and eight months behind on the on the last deadlines. Um, and, and rather than like meet any of these deadlines, they're just updating policies and also you know getting suits filed against them by uh, the AMA and the uh, trade associations and university re researchers who use this stuff. They're essentially just destroying any sense of there being a model aircraft or drone industry in this country and everything is going to go overseas if if our government doesn't step up and, and get on the ball it's just sad and as t2t2 typed in the chat room you may now check the drone box on your dtns bingo cards uh good stuff man and thanks <clears throat> thanks for 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 being passionate about this because uh, I, I think uh, I think a lot of people you know they go to the mall and they see the drones in the Brookstone store and they're like well that's cool maybe I'll get into that and they don't realize like all of these other things that are happening in the real world if you try to just like go to the beach and fly your drone for instance mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah like Martha Stewart does yeah she's got what a bunch for like parties yeah. or something yeah, yeah she's got at least three it was what I was reading in Vanity Fair or something like that so this is mainstream FAA you missed your opportunity the boat has sailed. That was 09. It's 2014. Tech is happening and you're not. All right, let's take a look at the calendar. Apple's new iPhone's on sale in 20 more countries today. Friday, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Ireland, Italy, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Portugal, Qatar, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Taiwan, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates. You can now try to bend an iPhone 6 Plus. Tomorrow marks the founding of the company called Google. You may have heard of it. They found it were founded back in 1998. Uh, if you want to get Google a birthday present, their Google Play wish list includes a space elevator, 100% European market share, and sentience. Or you could just buy Google a balloon. They're very fond of balloons. Sunday, September 28th is the start of the Oracle Open World Conference in San Francisco, as well as the Java One Conference, also in San Francisco. And September 29th is the start of the ISC2 Security Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, all of which run through October 2nd. Uh, my pick of the day, real quickly, uh, when I do the Tech Republic uh, videos, their five apps videos, I shoot them here on a green screen in the same room, and I've been memorizing the bits of the script, which is okay, but I just got a teleprompter for the iPad, Teleprompter Plus, uh, and, a, and I got a teleprompter, like, man, Teleprompter Plus is great. Yeah, we uh, used it on Hack 5 for a little while. It's, it's not bad for notes. 20 bucks. It's universal, so you can put it on the iPad and then control it from the iPhone, all for the same price. Uh, and then it can link with Dropbox or Google Drive to pull your scripts in. Uh, worked like a dream. So that's my pick. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Uh, finally, got some messages of the day. Rami in Padua, Italy writes, I have been listening to your talks about Europe and regulations and Google. I agree also that European community is a bit strange with these things. I live in Italy. We could have met here last week. Where were you? I actually passed through Padua in a train, but we didn't stop. But I waved. Uh, and I just hate some of the decisions the EU makes in the tech industry. Starting a few years ago with the browser choice screen on fresh Windows installs, which was not easy to get rid of, going to Windows N editions, Google results filtration, and since sometimes the alert that websites that operate in the EU need to show you about cookies. I don't know how these sites work when visited from outside the EU, but for me here, for every single website I visit that applies this regulation, which is around 80%, I see the bar top bottom floating about the use of cookies. I'm a computer science graduate and work in IT and I know about it and I don't want to see all these warnings. The bad part is that when I visit non-tech savvy friends, they ask me about those biscuit thingies that internet net sites use. Knowing the technical background of cookies will not help them get safer. They will still click on install free antivirus ads to get Trojan horses. EU wants to regulate things, but in my humble opinion, the decisions they are making are wrong and are complicating the life of everybody. That's a rant from the EU. Arrivederci. A la prosima. You know what I would love to see in regards to this? Imagine if, for instance, you were uh, you could vote with your dollar and say opt into buying dark tech, right? And use a dark internet that with the understanding that you don't have to go through nanny state kind of stuff where you've opted in with your dollar saying, look, listen, I accept the uh, I accept all of the stuff that's gonna come at me by doing this, but I prefer to have the unfettered and uh, don't come at me, bro. Yeah, you can do a VPN, and then you see fewer of those cookie warnings, although you still see some of them. Uh, Milia Grazi 
Rami for sending that. Anthony Lemos, uh, a.k.a. Ethan Kane, told us on Twitter that Verizon has enabled voice over LTE in Texas, so we asked him, have you tried it yet? Here's what he said. Uh, yes, noticeable voice quality improvement and voice data usable simultaneously. It even seems to dial and connect faster. Full disclosure, the test was completed between iPhone 6 Pluses in nearby proximity, uh, probably the same Verizon tower, uh, but he seems to like it in that one test anyway. So thanks, Anthony and or Ethan. Uh, for sending in a little Insta test of voice over LTE. Appreciate but if that. You, if you put both iPhones on speakerphone next to each other and then scream into it, do you still get awesome reverb and feedback? One would expect so. I, I don't think that's so. voice over LTE yeah. dependent. Let's, let's hope that that never gets fixed because that's just too much fun. All right. Uh, thank you, Darren Kitchen, hack5.org, hak5.org, uh, and Len Peralta at lenperaltastore.com. What are you telling me? You're setting me up. You're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to be very good today. This is this is disturbingly awesome. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I, I just want to make sure that I, I wasn't um, getting the tech wrong on this. But uh, Shellshock is a, not a worm. It, is it just can be wormified. It can right. be wormified. At least that's the theory. Well, I let it. I let this. I let. I just drew this because I thought it was funny. For the purposes of art, it can definitely <laughs> yeah, it's, be worth. It's it's a worm eating through an apple, and it's, the worm is saying, "You are safe by default." <laughs> In Tim Cook's voice, mm, yes, I would right. assume. You are safe by. But you are safe by default. No. Oh, but yeah, it's, it's dead on Tim Cook too. Thank yeah, you, so thank good. you. Yes, it's uh, on, up at my online store, and uh, don't forget to uh, support my uh, uh, me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash len. Thank you, Len. Uh, this is brilliant. Go check it out. Uh, even if you just want to take a look at it, audio listeners, lenperaltastore.com. This is like um, Ralph Steadman like worm face. A little bit, yeah. 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 It was very, it was very I love weird. It. This is pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, Hack 5, what's going on over there, Darren? Well, if you want to hear me rant a little bit more about this kind of drone stuff, we've got an excellent episode at hak5.org right now where I uh, you know, take you out to my favorite flying field and tell you about this hobby that I so enjoy, take you on board, first-person view of some of these quadcopters, and also talk a little bit about the regulations that we're facing and what you can do to get involved. We've already seen 32,000 comments on the, uh, on the FAA's special interpretation of the model aircraft rules, and uh, yeah, let's fight the good fight. Excellent. Also, Th specific, Tom, uh, specific to you, I would also like to thank you as uh, as you've presented me with the epic gift of USB goodness from the Vatican. And your note was the most endearing, Tom. Seriously, I've never received any more geek love than this. Uh, and I just need everybody to know, Tom said, quote, you will always be path in my autoexec.bat. And to that, Tom, I can only say that you will always be the paren paren squiggle colon semicolon squiggle semicolon <laughs> slash bin slash bash taxi reboot in my RC dash local. <laughs> You're making me tear up. Uh, thanks again, you guys, for filling in uh, when I was gone the other week. Really fun. appreciate it. Uh, check out our Patreon. We've got 4,299, almost 4,300 people uh, supporting the show. Sincere thanks to every single one of you. We're glad you see some value in the show and are willing to give some value back. Uh, if you are one who's like, you know, I don't know what's with Patreon. I don't know this stuff. Go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate. We have all the options for supporting the show there, and we really appreciate everybody who can. And whether it's just telling somebody about the show uh, does support the show. Don't forget you have a voice in what stories we cover. That could be your one way of, of participating or one of many ways. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Email us feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Give us a call 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. And listen to the show live at mobile.alphageekradio.com. You can visit our website at DailyTechNewsShow.com. We'll be back on Monday with Alpha Geek Radio's Todd Whitehead as our guest. Talk to you then. Yay. We made it. All right. Hey, I have to take off because i got to take my son out to his uh, marching band man. thing. Oh, marching no, band. marching band thing. So. Uh, uh, we'll remember to grab some spaghetti on the way. I will. <laughs> All right. I will, man. See you guys later. Awesome. Thanks, Len. Bye, Len. Bye. I have to go, too, and look at an office like a grown-up. Go.
Fly, my friends. Fly. Have fun taking time. With your marching bands and your offices. Oh, man, that was good. I didn't realize that I had it in me. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, like, dude. You, you must have hit a button or something. I got a little fired up. No, it was a Darren rant. That was uh, awesome. But, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I forgot to say some of the more, um, I don't know, <laughs> same Balanced stuff. portions. <laughs> Balanced are... stuff. All right, yeah, fair yeah. enough. But, yeah, you know, you know. Anyway. We can deal with it next time yeah. with, the, with the response emails. <laughs> oh, man. The ranting flowed like liquid, says Nth Mike. I'm hoping that things don't, you know, uh, really go south with the drones and uh, that I will be prohibited from flying anywhere but the new Hack 5 warehouse. <laughs> oh, yes, it's official. <laughs> is it official now? It That's is awesome. Official. Yeah. Congrats, man. That's great. We're excited. Yeah. So, uh, can you park the van inside the warehouse? If I got a ramp, I might be able to, but we've got a loading dock instead. I just want to see that shot. I know, of the I know. Van, I want like... We can finally put the jib back in, and I want the jib with the van. It, trust me, I know, I know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in a quote unquote my first warehouse. You know, it's only like five thousand square feet, but because uh, I want to see it like leap out the front door of the warehouse. Mm -hmm. Well, know? how's, how's then... this? I'll get the I'll get the uh, stabilized <laughs> drone shot that goes from the warehouse through the warehouse and then like under the boxes and through the forklift and then into the van. Nice. So, That'll then, work. Yeah. The show. And That'll then, it, and then the, then the van just starts driving and you're like, wait, is the drone you driving what? the van? Oh, Ooh, I like on? that. Yes. Or like it follows the van, like as the van is driving and then boom, flies into the, the warehouse and then I'm there with like the half pipe that we're building because <laughs> you can't have a warehouse without a half pipe. It turns out it's code in Richmond, I hear. Yeah, yeah, or maybe two quarter pipes and a uh, and a zip line. Nice. <laughs> there was a great article about Richmond recently, and it being like a secret haven. Yeah, please don't, please don't pass that around. Rent's already bad enough. About how awful it is, and no one should ever move there. No one. The, the, every time we see hipsters on the streets here in Point Richmond, uh, I always make sure, like whoever I'm with, to just like change the subject real quick and speak very loudly as I pass them. I'm like, I know, I can't believe they snatched the baby right here. <laughs> or man, did you smell the refinery fire this morning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe they snatched the baby and threw it into the refinery <laughs> fire. What kind of sacrificial fools? You know that's the wrong order if you want to appease the dark one. You take it to the top of Mount Tam first. Obviously. Obviously. And then strap it to a drone. Oh my gosh, did you see cat drone? No, I did not oh. see cat drone. Somebody took a somebody took a cat, the taxidermied cat. I can only imagine it. It looked lifelike. It must have been a taxidermied cat, <laughs> and then spread its uh, its paws out. Uh, this is kind of horrible, but also kind of like maybe a little sweet in in a weird sense, where oh, the wait, person like a, loves their cat so much and too, they, they wanted it to continue on. And so um, yeah, it's a it's a cat quadcopter. Man, we got no no clear leader on the titles. Oh, oh what's the uh, URL again? I always forget. Showbot.replex.org. Okay, yeah, Everybody, yeah. go in there and vote right now. Oh, that's horrible. There's a lot of awesome things, but no votes. See, when you first said "ello," the first thing I thought of was "ehlo," like what you would say to an SMTP server over Telnet. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Echo, hello. <laughs> I always thought that was interesting about that old protocol where it's like yeah. you would identify yourself by doing E H L O. Wasn't was like, there also a Hilo? Or something? Wasn't there a command that was H E L O? Am I just making that up? Yeah, yeah, there were some spelling mistakes in some yeah. of these old protocols, which I love. Mm -hmm. Pseudo Hulk bash. Mm -hmm. Well, anytime we get a pseudo joke, it's good. It's pseudo and Hulk joke in one. That's yeah, pretty oh, damn Hulk bash. impressive. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Mm, anybody else? Let's see. It's a fog. Nah, I don't think that's going to catch on, actually. Well, it's not going to catch on if we try to push it, either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although, it's a fog is now winning. Although, if it's... Uh... Oh, well, yeah. then again, you had... What was uh, yesterday's title? Bash, with the asterisks, like mash. Oh, cute, cute. I like that. Wow, it's a fugs running away with it. 
it, shouldn't it be um, shebang? It's a fug. <laughs> it should, or I guess you can't put pound exclamation point in your. Uh, Can I? In your no, you can't put that in a file name. Uh, I couldn't put it. I, I won't put it in the file name, but I could put it in the uh, the headline in WordPress. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 in WordPress you could do that. Ooh. My favorite use of this uh, bash bug is actually the DHCP one. <laughs> Have you seen this? Or if you're using um, uh, DHCP CD on Linux to get an IP address from a DHCP server, uh -huh. and the DHCP server is uh, is set up maliciously, it can uh, do remote execution on your machine. I oh. just love that. There's something beautiful about that. It's symmet It's very symmetrical, right? Mm -hmm. Or asymm reverse symmetrical. There's something elegant. Mm -hmm. Darren is spelled with a capital D, Tom. Duh. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like, Actually, now that... Oh, no, I'm not using it yet. I was about to say, I'm ch going to change my formal name. I'm going to change my middle name to Dot. <laughs> didn't Although... Somebody, didn't somebody do that, or am I just thinking of the Dot Com people who sold their names to Dot Coms? Yeah, yeah. And then there was that uh, that character, Friend of Grizz on 30 Rock. Oh, yeah. Dot Com. Mm -hmm. I remember Grizz. Grizz and Dot Com, yeah. Oh, so, right, and Dot Com. Right, right, right. Dot Com was his name, yeah. It's a pretty great name. Until it's no longer the most popular TLD. Which can we make predictions right now on when that will be? I think it will be okay. Which what is your question? Is it when will it technically be the least not the most popular TLD? Or when or will when it go will out of our public consciousness? Mm. You know, like when will oh, it sure, by sure. traffic stats actually be like, well, people are going, you know, dot com is actually you're right, you're right. Uh, it, like, because I think that'll happen sooner. I think dot com will just be like album. Mm -hmm. you so, know? like maybe in the sense of internet infrastructure, certain things will always be there. For example, HTTP colon slash slash is still there, but browsers don't show it anymore because we're all like, dude, we got rid of that in the '90s. Do you remember those Dove commercials that ended in HTTP colon slash slash www dot dove dot com? And you're yeah, like, yeah. wow, you just wasted half your commercial. Um, and then we dropped the www, so maybe we'll just... I always thought that a symbol would take over, you know? Like something that could be uniquely identified like as a... Like a musical instrument? <laughs> yeah, like a musical instrument. No, 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 no. Kind of like a treble clef. Like, you can... Well, they've allowed non-Roman uh, non alphabet characters now, so why not? Mm. Let's get Zap Dingbats in there as a Ooh. domain. Ooh. Well, I, I thought Dingbats was replaced with Webbats because of the whole 9-11 thing. Was it really? Yeah, if you typed um, nine, uh, if you typed nine eleven or something in uh, webdings, not webdings, dingbats, mm -hmm. it would show, um, it would show a plane and then towers or something like that. Hang on, I have to look this one up. It's pretty good. Oh, that's a unfortunate. I, I, how did I miss that? I never. It was windings. Nine eleven. It was windings. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, wing. Windings. windings. Having a wing ding, are you? Oh yeah, it's um, an airplane, two towers, and then a skull. Mm. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Oh no, it's when you type in NYC. Ah. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. I was not reading enough Drudge at some point. I don't apparently. think Nostradamus was using web dings, was he? Per I'm pretty sure he predicted its use, though, so mm -hmm. he would know the character set. That would make sense. I yeah. I've always just used the Unicode equivalent. <laughs> yeah. What's that in HTML? Ampersand and BSP semicolon? No, that's not going to work. Ampersand, pound, 123, semicolon. Mm -hmm. Oh, now that I think about it, I might be able to do ANSI in HTML that way. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, can I? No. Percent sign 20. I was really hoping. No. Well, no, like why? Why isn't ANSI part of, part of like if we've made most fonts Unicode with all of the you know non, um, help me out here symbols. Sorry, I'm all, I'm trying to yeah. fill out forms at the same time I'm listening, um, and I can't think of it. Damn it. Uh, ask. Wait, what? Yeah. I need to know this. HTML character codes, right? And that's for ASCII. Right. 
you can get like copyright, and then there's like um, you know shorthand ampersand copy, right? But where's the one that's the Miss Pac-Man? You know, like there's the smiley face, and then there's the block, and then the shaded block, the slightly more shaded block, the even more opaque shaded block. It's the way you want to if you want to show the open and close, you know, the less than greater than signs. You got to use a, uh, oh, ampersand yeah. LT, LT, and and uh, GT. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which I was always like. LT for left tag, GT. Wait a minute. I oh, know greater than. <laughs> yeah, like Tommy, my mnemonic to, was horrible. You have to remember the alligator that's going to eat the other number. It was like yeah, no, but my mnemonic was oh LT for the left tag, and then the other one is the on the right. <laughs> like that's a horrible mnemonic. Why didn't I just think less than and greater than? <laughs> it works. It works. No, it I, half worked. I could never remember G. Whatever. Though. Once you get the LT, it's obvious what the RT is going to be. Oh, wait. No, but it's, it's G. RT. It's not mm -hmm. R. That's that's what would always throw me off. Oh, interesting. Uh, ampersand shy semicolon is a soft hyphen, a.k.a. a blank character. Oh. I've always used NBSP semicolon, which is a space character. Oh, it's a non-breaking space. NBSP is the non-breaking space. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Which is... Between NBSP and transparent, that GIF, that pretty much sums up my horrible web design. <laughs> but I'm learning. <laughs> Wait, I, what about Blink? You I had have, to put a Blink tag in at some point. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. We're, we're talking about HTML and like codes that weren't uh, legit. Um, yeah, Blink was... I was going to use Blink, but then Blink was also hated. And there's better... Examples where the tags are actually quite useful and yet non-standard. Of course, B and and I are not deprecated. Yeah, well, they shouldn't be because I use them. You're hey, supposed to use M. Oh, whatever. And, and here's th this is going back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like, well, you know, strong. we can't fix it because people are using it. Uh, it's a yeah, I think, now. I think WordPress is the one that if you type B and I, it'll change it to M and strong, or mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah, I always uh, take the trailing slash out of my BRs, and I'm like, no, BR, we're not closing you. Stop trying to do that. <laughs> Screw you, XML. Yeah, you are not a closable tag to me. <laughs> you just get mad. Why does invalid HTML work? Because we all started using it. Yeah, because because even though there's a standard, it is up to the browsers to decide mm -hmm. whether they'd actually implement the standard, and they all implemented it a little differently because they wanted a competitive advantage. Our browser will show blink tags, Ooh. so everyone will download our browser now. Yeah, and then we can get an animated GIF of a E spinning around, and then we can put it at the bottom of our page, best viewed in VGA with Internet Explorer 2. Oh God! I remember. I remember the moment that I gave up on that, where I was like, you know, no, I am not putting a compatible with these seventeen versions of browsers anymore. Forget it. I'm done. Yep. Yep. Which is why I'm only using HTML on my new website with a little bit of JavaScript to paint it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm bringing ASCII back. Mm, not if I don't first. You're bringing ANSI back, right? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm going to bring ANSI back. I'm gonna, you know what? Here's the thing. I actually have already figured out what I'm going to do, and it's kind of sad. If Hopefully there's already a framework for this, but if there isn't, I will be writing JavaScript that translates whatever characters I choose to use as ANSI into individual GIF files that are properly <laughs> sized equivalents of them. And so I'll just have to screenshot every single ANSI thing, bring it into Photoshop and crop it out and save it as its character code. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but it's totally worth it. And you know what? By then, when you've loaded like a thousand GIF files <laughs> in sequence on your browser, it'll be as slow as a 300 baud modem. And then it'll just feel more realistic. That's right. <laughs> and you're worth it. Yes. Oh, man, this is taking forever. Okay. Yeah, that website I sent you, I actually had to throw in slowdown code because I was like, ah, it's painting too fast. Yeah. I need I'm to sure. make it look like no faster than a 14.4. Anything more than that is just kind of like, meh. Uncivilized. Mm -hmm. All right. I am going to assume that this is going to work. Cool. 
I am going to go quasi-legally fly quadcopters indoors with first-person totally goggles. Legal. I might be violating airspace that 747s might, <laughs> might fly through your warehouse. You, yes, but uh, let's hope not. All right, thanks, man. All right, cheers, Talk dude. To you.